Okay, um, Atif, Marcus, uh, thanks a lot for inviting our paper. So this is joint work with uh, Umid Gurun from Dallas and my colleague Amit Seru. So this paper is about this. It's about mortgage advertising, okay? So during the run up to the crisis, we saw advertising was going through a roof in mortgages. Mortgages didn't do that well after the crisis. And mortgage advertising looked kind of shifty from a couple of examples that we have. I mean, these are sort of two examples. The one on the right is actually the, I would call it the most honest example of mortgage advertising you kind of find if you look for examples. So it tells you that the mortgage they're selling is an arm. Okay, good. It tells you that it adjusts. It tells you that the first five years are fixed at 4.25%. Doesn't really tell you what happens after, aside from the fact that it adjusts, okay? But that's like really informative relative to this ad, which by the way is for ARMs, but if you looked at this, you would never see this, okay? It tells you that they're specializing in the 1% mortgage, so they're really cheap. Um, and they tell you a bunch of things that are actually just not right. Uh, for example, they offer 40 to 50 year loans, which they're not allowed to do on individual residences in the US, okay? So this was a fraudulent ad. So kind of facts, advertising going through the roof, mortgage is not doing that well, mortgage, individual mortgage ads looking shifty, the conclusion kind of was a general idea that advertising was kind of shifty and it was hurting the consumers in this market, okay? Uh, there was a big litigation response to this based on the idea that in particular in ARM mortgages, the fact that the mortgage reset into what was not very clear. So there's sort of a bunch of big legal cases. One of the bigger ones is the Fed and DOJ, for example, fine Wells Fargo for sort of not, you know, not cleanly advertising stuff. There's another sort of interesting angle that kind of tells you, look, mortgage uh, minorities were especially kind of subject to, to this kind of things, okay? So that's interesting. Uh, the second response to this is a massive, massive increase in regulation of how mortgages can be advertised, okay? Several regulatory agencies, Fed, FTC, and then Congress with Dodd-Frank kind of tell you, hmm, look, we should really regulate advertising. It's shifty. It's affecting consumers in ways we don't want to, okay? So that's kind of interesting because if you think about what we actually know is we know that we have a couple of examples of shifty mortgage advertising, okay? We know that there was a lot of it, but I think most of the time we don't think of that as sufficient evidence for sort of heavy-handed regulation. So in this paper, what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to step back and sort of see, you know, what's the evidence in this market, okay? But we'll run into a problem that you always run into, and that's why I think anecdotes are not enough. How do you tell whether advertising was good because there's a bunch of good advertising in the world that informs consumers, or that advertising is bad, meaning it draws consumers into making really shifty choices, okay? My favorite example of that is imagine advertising of apples rather than oranges, okay? You see advertising of apples going up, people go to the store, buy a ton of apples. What did advertising do? Did it make them better off or worse off? Well, imagine consumers came home with a bunch of apples. They realized, yum, apples are crispy. I can bake them in a pie. They have a lot of vitamins. Awesome. I was really informed by this advertising how awesome apples are, okay? Alternatively, as they come home, bite into an apple, they realize, hmm, I really wish I had bought oranges because I could have made fresh orange juice. I really value this more than, more than an apple. Um, so kind of, that tells us, you know, it's hard to just tell whether advertising is helping or hurting consumers from some sort of basic facts. You have the same problem with mortgages. How can I tell a consumer that the mortgage they picked, sort of some balloon weird, you know, um, uh, interest only mortgage was not good for them? I mean, maybe that was their preference, okay? So what are we gonna try to do in this paper? First, we're gonna focus on a dimension where we think the problems were, which is people are worried that consumers didn't understand how these mortgages reset, in particular the RMs. That's what we're gonna look at, reset rates for ARM mortgages. Then we're gonna look at a framework in which we can compare mortgage choices across borrowers. We're gonna try to find choices that consumers kinda could have made that would have made them better off. What do I mean by better off? How do we resolve the apple orange problem, okay? Price, okay? Suppose you and I buy the same apple, but I paid three times for this apple, I'm worse off than you are, okay? So this is what we're gonna try to do for mortgages. We're gonna try to look at sort of mortgages, find consumers who are kind of looking the same, buying the same product, but paying a higher reset rate for the product at the same time in the same location. We're gonna argue if we do that very well. That's gonna be the crux of the paper, okay? And then we're gonna relate 
how much advertisers spend to how they price mortgages. And we're going to show that within a market, expensive guys are the guys who advertise a lot, which will be a bit of a problem for kind of a standard informative story of, of advertising. And then I'm going to show you a little bit about how mortgage ads actually look and sort of do a much more systematic approach to instead of showing you two pictures. Okay? That will lend some additional support for what I'm saying. Okay? So let's, let's talk about what data we use. We use three primary sources of data. First, it's mortgage data. And the important thing to know is that we're going to look at subprime mortgages. These are not prime mortgages. These are not rich people. It's important that these are sort of subprime mortgages of, of, of low credit score people. Then we add two advertising data sets. One is an advertising intensity. Think of it as dollars of advertising. Okay? That's TNS uh, media intelligence. And we're going to look there at the local advertising in a market. Okay? We have data for national advertising too, but there is no cross-sectional variation I can use, so I'll look at only local advertising. Then we're going to look at Mintel or com uh, Compare Media data, where we're going to actually see what's advertised, okay? the content. What, is, what do the ads actually say? I'm going to look at this data till 07 because there is no subprime securitized mortgage market after this. Okay? Let's talk about what we do. So as I said, what we're going to try to do is we're going to look at a consumer in a certain location at a certain time who got a certain mortgage. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to find another consumer in the same place at the same time with the same characteristics who got the same mortgage, including LTV, had the same FICO scores, everything, had the same introductory interest rate, but their re reset rates in their mortgage differ. Okay? I mean, I'm going to say that the consumer who had a highest, higher reset rate got a worse mortgage. And how much is going to measure how much worse this mortgage was. Okay? So I'm going to have to operationalize this in the data somehow. And the way I do it is the following. On the left-hand side, this is the reset rate for a borrower in a location, time, and so on. On the right-hand side, you have borrower characteristics. So this is FICO score, LTV, so on. Location fixed effect. So these are comparing the guys in the same location. Time fixed effect. So this is not about sort of trends and so on. Okay? So I'm trying to get kind of guys in the same location at the same time with the same characteristics. Also conditioning on the same initial interest rate. So these are guys who pay the same initial interest rate. Okay? And then look at just the differences in the reset rate. So the residual from that regression is going to be what I'm interested in. How much do guys who look the same, who get the same mortgage, pay differently in pricing? It's important how we measure this. So we robustness check the heck out of this. We do sort of polynomials. We slice it into 20 bins by initial interest rates, so 20 bips of interest, uh, of interest rate, initial interest rates. Run separate regressions, compute residuals, all sorts of stuff. It looks all the same. Okay. So fact number one that's kind of interesting, people pay really, really different reset rates, even if they look the same in the same area at the same time. Okay. So here I'm just plotting the residuals from this regression. Minus one tells you your, your reset rate was one percentage point lower than a guy in the same location at the same time with the same characteristics who paid the same initial interest rate and so on. Okay? So huge dispersion. People who look the same in the same places pay very different uh, interest payments. How big are these differences? We're going to average these residuals in a location at a point in time by lender. And then we're going to compare expensive lenders, let's say 95th percentile, to cheap lenders, 5th percentile, in the same location. The mean difference between those lenders across our DMAs and, and time is about 3%. Okay? So if consumers actually end up paying these resets, we're talking about, about $6,000 in different reset interest payments a year after resets kick in. Okay? So what does this have to do with advertising? Okay? People pay very different prices. What does this have to do with advertising? Okay? I mean, this. Uh, so this is a super simple cut of the data. The dashed black line is mortgages lent by guys who don't advertise. The red one is by the guys who advertise. Okay? What do you see? The guys who advertise sell more expensive mortgages. You're concerned about whether I'm, I'm sort of taking care of everything properly, so I'm going to show you regressions. Okay? So what's in these regressions? On the left-hand side, you get the average residual in a certain location by lender at a certain time. So that's how expensive is a lender at sort of a DMA in time. So that's the observation here. On the right-hand side, I have how much does this lender spend at a certain DMA at a certain time in terms of dollars. So that's going to be the basic specification. This is not driven by the fact that advertising goes up over time and somehow relative pricing goes up over time. 
because I have time fixed effects. This is not driven by the fact that lenders advertise a lot in locations which are really profitable or something. I have location fixed effects. Because it's not about house price growth or something like that. Okay? So these are two things. Plus, these residuals are already purged of sort of observables. Okay? The third thing that's super interesting, I think, is I also add lender fixed effects. What do lender fixed effects do to you? If you're worried that somehow our lenders are the expensive guys, are also the nice guys. They're sort of treat, nice, treat you nicely in renegotiation, or they don't rip you off somewhere else, lender fixed effects will kind of help. Okay, so what, what am I then going to be looking at? I'm looking at relative advertising in a location at a point in time. The guys who advertise more within a market are more expensive. In markets where these guys advertise more than everybody else, they're more expensive, okay? So even within lender. So, and I'm gonna interpret the magnitude slightly later. Okay, so this is the kind of the first interesting thing about advertising and pricing in this market, okay? If this has something to do with sophistication of the borrowers, you can sort of advertise, you get these sort of naive people in, they don't get, they're paying these high reset rates, then it better be working more for the guys who are less well informed. So we follow here Hall and Woodward and just cut our sample a bit into slices that look more or less sophisticated. So for example, what you'll notice is the positive correlation between the expensive guys are also advertising a lot works in areas with a lot of minorities, in areas where you have a less educated population. This is already conditional on a subprime sample, by the way, okay? And in areas where you have sort of poor people, okay? In other words, this is suspiciously starting to look like it's got something to do with sophistication, okay? Now you guys are of course really skeptical because you're economists and you've been trained to do so, okay? So you, you're saying to yourself already now, hmm, yeah, yeah, he's conditioned a ton of observables. This is within a certain period of time, which is a certain location. He's got the initial interest rate, FICOs, LTV, and so on. But what I'm really worried about is when you advertise in a market, you're starting to attract borrowers who on unobservables are kind of crappy credits, okay? So I have to charge them more to compensate me for that, okay? Or you're thinking these guys are really hard to deal with. Uh, so I have to be compensated for the fact that they're hard to deal with. And I'll show you that the numbers are enormous. It'd be really hard to find such costs to deal with, but, but, but we, we could, okay? So let's talk about the first one. Are these guys who are attracted to advertisers worse than their observable characteristics say? Well, we can actually look at that in the data. We can look at whether they repay the loan afterwards, okay? Or whether they got delinquent. So if anything, what we find is that the guys who are attracted by advertisers are less delinquent, given their observable characteristics, than the guys who are attracted to non-advertisers. So if anything, on unobservables, they're better credits. They're not only naive, they're also naive in when they keep on repaying these, these loans, okay? Um, the second thing we do is we look at a large lender, and we look at kind of, let's call them catering costs, okay, to, differ, to types that look like they're attracted to high advertising. We find very little differences in sort of characteristics uh, between borrowers who are susceptible to ads. And moreover, within this, expense, within this one enormous lender, uh, we can see when they advertise a lot and little. And we look at whether there's sort of differences in these kind of catering costs, we find nothing, okay? This already, I think, brings me pretty far in convincing us. I have a positive correlation between expensive guys within a market are the guys who advertise a lot, okay? Which is hard to reconcile with informative models of advertising. If you're still skeptical, what I'll propose is an IV for mortgage advertising. So what do I need? I need something to come in and hit the relative amount of advertising between lenders in a market, okay? And something that's hopefully orthogonal to unobserved characteristics of borrowers in this market, okay? So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna use the fact that Craigslist enters different areas in the US in a staggered fashion. And what we know from other research is that this will affect the amount of advertising that happens in this market. And hopefully it'll change the relative advertising within a market. So Craigslist can change overall advertising and even the quality, let's say, or pricing of mortgages. Uh, what I'm interested in is relative advertising in a market. Okay. Is it plausible that Craigslist would affect advertising in mortgages? Well, there you can, there's surveys that show yes. Uh, there is, we know that that's the same, that happens for job ads in newspapers. When Craigslist enters job ads in classifieds collapse massively, okay? But we sort of go and just scrape Craigslist ads for the period that 
our mortgages overlap, um, and for the markets in which there's Craigslist. We look at the financial services section and find that you, know, you get between 5 to 12% of ads on Craigslist financial services section are related to mortgages. Okay? So plausibly, Craigslist is doing something about mortgage advertising in this market. Okay? I'll tell you whether it's a good instrument, but plausibly, at least, it shocks advertising. Okay? What do I need for Craigslist to be a good instrument? Okay? What I need is for Craigslist, when it enters a market, it's either uncorrelated with, with sort of trends in advertising, but much more importantly, what has to happen is Craigslist does not enter markets in which the pricing between guys who advertise a lot and pricing between guys who advertise little is changing because unobservable types are sorting differently to these guys. Yeah, it gets really complicated, okay? So it already tells you kind of, it, it, it's, it's a sensible instrument, okay? I'm gonna sort of, Craigslist, this is just how they enter over time. You can see it's kind of scattered a bit. Um, and I'm not gonna show you regressions, okay? Trust me, the first stage is strong, the second stage is strong, blah, blah. I'm gonna show you pictures, okay? So here is what happens to guys who didn't advertise when Craigslist enters a market, okay? There's a little bit of a change in the distribution, but you can see that the mode of pricing is the same. There's a little shift in here. You can, look, you can do the same exercise for the guys who did advertise before Craigslist enters, and their advertising, we see that collapses, especially in newspapers, but you can also see that their pricing changes. The mode shifts to the left, okay? And you can sort of, and you can kind of see that the distribution of pricing shifted a bit more to the left. There's a little bump on the right, that's kind of the same as in this kind of, call it the control group, okay? So Craigslist enters, relative advertising collapses of advertisers to not advertisers, and that is reflected in pricing of these guys. So before I tell you how big these effects are, let's talk a little bit about whether this is a sensible, good IV. What are some of the things we do to convince you that this is a good strategy? First, the biggest drop in advertising you see is in newspapers. Good, that makes sense. This is sort of where Craigslist is hopefully crowding stuff out. We look at pre and post trends and observables. What do you see? You see when Craigslist enters, about a quarter before actually, advertising slowly starts declining, and then the big shock happens after it does. Nothing happens on observable characteristics of borrowers, which is what we'd be really worried about, okay? FICO scores, LTVs, prepay penalty, low docs, none of this stuff has any interesting pre-trends, post-trends with Craigslist entry, okay? The last thing we do is, of course, what you might be worried is that our advertisers who are paying for advertising before are now shifting onto Craigslist, advertising like crazy on Craigslist, so their advertising is actually increasing overall if we just counted that properly. Uh, so what we do is we go, we scrape Craigslist, we match it to our guys. First, not a lot of guys who were advertising before now do it on Craigslist. And second, the guys who did, we drop them, no changes in results, okay? So this is kind of the empirical strategy to convince you that it's the expensive guys in the market who advertise a lot. How big is this? We get an IV coefficient of about 0.07, a big deal. Uh, that means that for a $1,000 increase in advertising in a quarter in a DMA, you get a reset rate increase of about seven bips. How big is that? Well, um, average mortgage in the US is about $200,000 in our sample, in the subprime sample. Average spending of an advertiser in a quarter in our market is about $25,000. So that would translate in a standard, take a 15-year ARM, reset it after two years, so, so it's a two-year arm, and assume that the borrowers only pay the reset rate for three years, okay, because then they'll be refinanced or something else, okay? And this kind of 10% because it's a nice number, okay? What do you get? You get that this sort of additional uh, re, uh, reset that these guys pay takes them to a present value of about 7,500 bucks more expensive mortgage. That's a lot of money for these people. It's not crazy. I mean, Bob has a really nice paper in which he finds that the fees that people get, uh, char get charged from brokerage, uh, brokers when they're not sophisticated, get to it in, ab in about the same ballpark, if, if I'm right. Okay, so you can make these numbers really, really, really big if you want to by assuming that these guys are like stuck with this inexpensive mortgage forever. But I think that's quite unrealistic, okay? So this is the first piece of evidence we have in this paper on intensity of advertising and pricing of mortgages. Uh, and I think it's really hard to generate this kind of within market variation in a standard model of informative advertising. I mean, think of why. The only reason why you follow an advertiser is because they'll lead you to a cheaper mortgage, okay? 
if, if everybody's sort of fully rational and, and understands the equilibrium that's split. Okay? So it gets incredibly hard for consumers to see an ad and say, ah, I know you're expensive, but I'd like to buy from you anyway, even though I get nothing for it. Okay? So this will be sort of much more consistent with models in which consumers are kind of attracted, not kind of getting it, well, uh, not getting that they're being uh, shafted a bit. Can we say anything more by looking at content of advertising? Like, why is this happening? Okay? And here's what I'm going to tell you. First, the two examples you saw in the beginning are reasonably representative. Okay? What do I mean by that? You'll see that advertising puts a lot of attention on initial interest rates, pretty much doesn't talk about resets at all. I'm going to show you something quite bizarre, which is if you look at APRs that are advertised, they have practically no, actually, to be pre precise, they have a negative correlation with how expensive a mortgage is. So what you think is a sufficient statistic, maybe for a mortgage, will lead you to an expensive lender. Okay? Uh, and the last thing I'm going to show you is what, kind of, what is advertised. And the stuff that's advertised is nothing sophisticated. It's sort of, we sell mortgages. They have 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, there will be no product differentiation to speak of if you think that advertising is kind of helping consumers find the sophisticated product that really belongs to them. Okay? So let's talk a little bit about this. So let's first look at ads where, where advertisers tell you that these are arms. Okay? So they, they explain. They either say, this is an arm, there is a reset here, or just. They say something about that. 70% okay? of these guys adjust, uh, advertise an actual explicit initial interest rate. Okay? Only 13 mention a reset rate at all. So no reset rate mentioning. Okay? Then we said, OK, let's try to find these reset rates by working harder. We looked at all ads that had two percentage numbers in there and said, can we just find an initial interest rate and a reset rate somehow? We couldn't. Okay? If you see two numbers on there, the second number is probably an APR, or they advertise several other products. Here then, we hand, the, what, what we were left with is 128 mortgages we hand-checked. You just cannot find a mortgage ad, pretty much, that will mention an initial interest rate and an actual explicit reset rate. You, you just can't. Okay? Um, what else do ads do? They don't only mention actual numerical initial interest rates, they also emphasize them. Okay? They say things like, you don't see a reset anywhere, but you see things like as low as, intro, initial rate, starting at, okay? kind of emphasizing the sort of salience of initial interest rates, which might be why consumers are getting a bit confused. Okay? What else do we see? Um, you might say, well, who cares if they don't advertise initial interest rates? They tell you an APR. APR should be all you need to know. Turns out, if you look at, and this is a, quite a small sample, okay, 800 advertising campaigns. But you look at the guys who actually advertise the APRs, and we look at how expensive the mortgages they sell are, if anything, you see a negative correlation. Okay? So that's just really inconsistent with a standard sort of informative advertising model in which the posted price takes you to a cheap, you know, to a, to a product with the same price. And if you post a high price, you get a high uh, cost product. If you post a low price, you get a low co cost product. That's not the case in this data. Okay? The last thing is, what is actually then advertised? If it's not a reset rate, if it's only initial interest rates, is there something sort of subtle in there? And it's simple. What they advertise is we sell 10, 15, 20-year mortgages. So Horizon, they tell you maybe we reset after five years. That's good. They tell you we sell mortgages that are $200,000. That's something. But that's about all the detail you get. Okay? What's for sure not advertised, because we looked hard, is like, we're really nice to you. When we service the mortgage, we're not going to screw you. We're going to renegotiate nicely. None of that stuff is there. Okay? So if you have a subtle story in mind how these sort of mortgage advertisers are, are kind of telling you that this is a specialized product, it just, it's not in the data. Okay? So what's this paper about? Uh, it's about facts in advertising in the mortgage market. Okay? And the facts are there is a big dispersion in these recent rates that are charged to borrowers. And generic models of advertising, of informative advertising, have a really hard time explaining these facts. Okay? Within market correlation that's positive between advertising and pricing, just shouldn't happen. Okay? Uh, there, it should be negative or at best zero. Uh, and the only thing that's advertised is actually generic information and the initial rate. This is much more consistent with some sort of a model in which you have some consumers, not all, but some consumers who are not sophisticated, 
And advertising increases the salience of these initial rates and doesn't really tell you much about reset rates, okay? And there's a lot of heterogeneity, okay? There's some consumers, some borrowers who are being affected by this stuff, such as low education minority borrowers, okay? Now, I'm not saying that they, by the way, that minority or borrowers pay higher interest rates. It's that within that segment of the population, advertising is playing a particular role, okay? Uh, so this heterogeneity is important too, okay? That's it, thank you very much. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, we have a question time. My question basically is, can you give us a sense of, uh, if I wanted to think of like a variance decomposition, so how much of the effect is given by lenders, some lenders that are concentrating on transition versus others not so much? And the other part of variation is, like, given that they're varying either over time or across space in the intensity of their effect. Yeah, so in short, um, I should have these numbers <laughs> more, more, more at, at the tip of my tongue, and I don't. Because uh, we focus so hard on kind of rejecting the. I know you have a fixed technology. Yeah, that. so, so that, that's why I'm sort of, I, I, I do, to be honest, I just, I, I just don't remember um, sort of how much. So a, a lot of the, what I can tell you is what's interesting is a lot of the variation in pricing comes between lenders. So a lot of times these models tell us that, you know, you should have um, randomization in prices in these search models. Um, there should be no persistent variation in pricing between, uh, over time. That's rejected in the data. Expensive guys stay expensive. And that potentially people should randomize within, or firms. That happens, but, most of, but a lot of the variation comes from just expensive cheap lenders. Now, how much of the variation in advertising is within a guy is cross-sectional time series, I just don't remember. But there's a big trend in, in sort of amounts of advertising over time. Um, that, that's sort of what I have, sorry, off, off the top of my, my mind. Uh, so I just wanted to follow up on that. So what do you think is driving the variance within lender that you use in the lender fixed effect specifications? Like why would lenders choose to advertise in some markets and not others? Yeah, so um, it could, uh, you know, one of the one possibilities is simply experimentation. I mean, I don't think, look, if everybody knew, in some ways our advertising, the numbers we get are really profitable. Okay, advertising is a really good strategy. Yeah. Now we don't have all the costs of advertising. You know, we have advertising expenditures in the local market, so we don't know how much it costs to set up your advertising campaign, all this kind of stuff. But it kind of looks profitable. Uh, so in some ways, the question is, why do we? Can we construct an equilibrium in which different guys, some guys advertise, some guys don't? We could, if advertising was expensive enough on sort of these fixed costs. Everybody's on a zero profit condition. Um, but I have a sense, because advertising was sort of shooting through the roof over time, that people just are learning over time how, how productive it is. And it's possible that you have variation between, simply because I don't, I don't quite know how, how productive advertising is. But so does the variation within lenders across areas persist over time? Because under that learning model, you know, you'd think you'd see some convergence, right? Like I figure it out, yeah, it's working should, in market you know, A. I, you know, I should look. The uh, dispersion should be following, that's something. I should look. So this paper is a big new step in in this burgeoning field of uh, looking at how poorly people sh shop for uh, mortgages, uh, and you know the findings are are very supportive of of the, my work with uh, Susan. Um, the I guess we had the advantage of being able to measure the actual retail markup, um, and that conditions automatically for a lot of the things that you're conditioning for. Just in the data, do you do you have are, do are any of these uh, so, go through brokers and do you have so a yield spread have, premium? So we have so so here's what we have we have um, similar to your guys' data we have a data from another big firm in which we see sort of all the fees and stuff like that. Most of the stuff that we focus on is no is is, is sort of is going to be sort of big big lenders, especially because we want to exploit variation. You, by that you mean integrated lenders, so there's no yield spread premium reported. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, but, but, but we do look at that, that one lender, we do the same experiment in there to see, is it possible that it's the variation in, in fees uh, that would be kind of undoing our stuff? That doesn't seem to be the right, case. Right. Now, so what Susan's been working on most recently is what the disclosure requirements ought to be. What, 
designing a box that would be like the nutrition box for food um, that uh, would have to be included in an ad. Um, I think you're, you, you've clarified for, for these, you know, obviously some clear disclosure of what the reset means in very simple language and not, you know, the, the problem with disclosures has been that you hand them over to the lawyer and then the lawyer comes back with 76 pages in eight point type light gray uh, and that's their idea of a disclosure and that prevents them from being sued but it doesn't tell the consumer anything useful. Uh, the Department of Agriculture overcame that uh, um, but we've never been able to extend the agricultural disclosure to any other product. So I see our paper as maybe a necessary but not sufficient uh, condition for that. So I'm very happy to tell that consumers were being sort of, were being drawn into expensive stuff. It looks like it was on, on these dimensions. I, I might be willing to speculate that more disclosure would work. I just, to be honest, I, nothing in my paper says that if we give consumers this sort of couple of very salient things, they'll do better. Well, one thing that's very, very important that that's just been, been completely clear here is that all disclosures have to be tested. Yeah. And uh, it's too bad that Chris is no longer here, right? Because he's in charge of that now. Yeah, I know. What is wrong with perhaps a model like a foot in the door? The reason why I actually don't, understand, don't advertise, don't tell you what the reset rate is, is my advertisement is just to get me, to get you to my office. And then when you are in my office, I spend a lot of time with you. And so that's where also potentially the higher costs come. And then I lead you in all of these different contracts that you don't understand anyway. And so you forgot the advertisement. So the advertisement was only to get you in the door. Oh, I, I'm, I'm happy to believe with that. I mean, the, the, if, if I had to write down a model, I would write down a model in which what advertising does is pulls you in the door and then as a consumer, you don't realize that it's the expensive guys who are dragging you in there. You sort of feel you have an unbiased draw from a distribution of, of pricing. You're doing optimal search. Um, now, the, is it... Uh, now, I think where you, you have a twist on this is, well, but when I pull you in the door, it's really expensive to deal with you. Right. And I have to pass this. Now, is it $7,500 more expensive? I doubt it. Uh, and the other thing is, we, we do look at the actual fees uh, in these contracts and see how, if they're passed on to the consumer how much. We don't see much there. So I, just, I, I think we can, we can reject this reasonably well. Um, I also want to give a... Um, <laughs> No, 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 I, 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 was, I was just uh, uh, suggesting this, but what I wanted to tell you that in the National Financial Capability Study, look and, you can look and it's true that, uh, as Bob was saying, people, even with mortgages, which are so important, these are the instrument where they search more, but I think like one third doesn't do any searching. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, and I'm, you can also look at some of the characteristic you have here and really actually link to what they do with the mortgages. So I think it would probably you know, provide some indirect support to some of the theory you might be looking at. When you look at services and products, uh, hard products, uh, let's say uh, appliances, um, uh, the kind of things that are sold in Best Buy, it seems that the adoption rate for shopping uh, on the internet and getting, getting sharp prices seems pretty good over the last number of years, right? So then, then the question comes, if you extrapolate from one product category to another, is there a discontinuity in the willingness of consumers, if, assuming the apps, the search mechanisms, and the comparison uh, software is available, to do the kind of um, searches and get sharp pricing and have people competing against each other online or in person like you do for a car or uh, you know, some sort of a stereo equipment? Um, whether or not you can extrapolate from that and anticipate that that will occur over time. I'm, I'm sure it'll help. I mean, what's, what's nice about, you know, an iPod is that I know that when I buy an iPod from, you know, Best Buy or Amazon, and I just have this, the simple thing, I know it's the same iPod. When I walk into, you know, your store, your, your more broker, right, you're like, well, we have this set of products, they're complicated products, let me just give you the highlights. So it makes them a bit harder to compare. But I am hopeful that, for example, if Susan gets us a food box, 
that we can then, or Dick Thaler has been sort of pushing for this very hard, that we can easily compare mortgages that are standardized, maybe we can get there. I just, first, all these effects are for the very, sort of within subprime, they work for low educated people, which already tells you this is less educated people and we still have to cut it there. Uh, so I don't know how much they will get out of that, but I'm very happy to believe that technology and information will get us part there. Remember, there's a response from the suppliers too. They want to obfuscate more when you have more, uh, when you have more competition as well. So I don't know what the equi resulting equilibrium will be. Thank you very much. Uh